good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the ICS uh, Distinguished Lecture Series on Information Technology and Society. I'm Iris Pabefinu, the Dean for the School of Information and Computer Sciences. Uh, it's a great pleasure and, and a privilege to introduce our speaker for the fall quarter, uh, Dr. Alex Pentland. Uh, Dr. Pentland grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He attended the University of Michigan as an undergraduate. He then went on to receive his PhD in psychology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, he moved to the West Coast for a number of years at Stanford University, but then he moved back to the East Coast and he joined the faculty at MIT in 1986, uh, where he's currently, he's still there, and he's currently a Toshiba Professor of Media Arts and Sciences. He's also director of the MIT Human Dynamics Laboratory and the MIT Media Lab Entrepreneurship Program. There's a long list of accolades, and, and Dr. Penland really told me, you don't have to go through the entire list, but, but I, need, I need to read the next paragraph just to scratch the surface of all the accomplishments for our speaker today. It's really indeed a privilege. Uh, Dr. Penland co-leads the World Economic Forum Big Data and Personal Data Initiatives. He's a founding member of the advisory boards for Nissan, Motorola, Mobility, Telefonica, a variety of startup uh, firms. He has previously helped create and direct the MIT Media Lab, the Media Lab Asia at the Indian Institutes of Technology, and Strong Hospitals Center for Future Health. More than 50 PhD students graduated under Dr. Pentland's uh, mentorship. About half of them are tenured faculty at leading institutions, another quarter leading industry research groups, another final quarter funding their own companies. Dr. Pentland, it's, it's, it's a privilege. Please join me in welcome him to the party. Turn my little electronics on here. So thank you for having me here. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about big data, AI, where we're going. Um, the motivation for this, and part of the context is, you know, we live in an era where we have data about things that we never had before. We all carry mobile phones. It says all sorts of things about us. Uh, 20 years ago, it was common to start a talk, for me at least, saying half the people in the world have never made a phone call, and today, 90 to 95 percent of the people have a phone, which means we know where they are all the time, who their friends are, something about what they buy. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It's an incredible transformation. If you can compare that to, for instance, the number of people that can read, you know, the number of people that can read, despite hundreds of years of progress, is much smaller than the number of people that have a phone. What can we do with this? So, about a decade ago, I started a conversation in the World Economic Forum with people like the Justice Commissioner of the EU, the Chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, the CTO of Microsoft, etc., to try and establish the rules of the road for dealing with data. And that grew into the GDPR regulations uh, that we have today, <coughs> protecting our privacy, and we continue to move on. Um, and I focused myself on how do we use this sort of data uh, to be able to build a better world. And um, I'm on the board of directors for the UN's Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data and Sustainable Development Finance, which is to say, if you can measure what's happening everywhere in the world, which is part of the sustainable development goals, then you can condition money on it. You can make the IMF and other people charge interest rates and give loans only if countries are reducing inequality, addressing poverty, and things like that. And that actually has a chance of changing the way the world works. So those are some of the things that do. I'm also on the advisory board for the American Bar Association because it requires changing the law in some cases. And I'm going to tell you about stuff that comments on those things so you can ask me questions. I'm going to go fast, and I'm going to talk about some of the spin-offs that we have because one of the things I do is I start companies. One of the reasons I start companies is that people don't read my papers all that much. <laughs> People don't read my papers, but, but, but I get frustrated. I want things to go faster, so I convince a lot of my students to go start companies. I'll just mention that. So, um, 
One of the big things that I noticed today is that people talk about all of the problems of how scary AI is and all this data and what about blockchain and our robot overlords and all that sort of stuff. And I think that all of those are symptoms of a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is that the world is becoming increasingly digital, increasingly efficient, increasingly faster. And we poor humans are not keeping up with it. Our institutions have not changed for often for centuries. The way we think about ourselves has not changed significantly for centuries. And in fact, most of what we do is conditioned on the thinking about human nature that happened in the late 1700s. We're individual, rational people. We make decisions to benefit our own utility. That's the source of democracy. That's the source of, of markets, capitalism. And that's what runs our societies worldwide, pretty much. Is that true? Are we rational individuals? And I'm going to argue that we are only 50% rational individuals. And that actually social context and social interaction is at least half of our decision making. And that's what accounts for fads, norms, uh, panics. And that's what we have to build into our social institutions in order to get a better society. Okay? There we go. Now you know. <laughs> now for the entertainment part. Um, so this is me 20 odd years ago. Um, I'm this one here. <laughs> it was clear that, that computers were shrinking. They were going to be on your body. It was going to be wireless. So this is before there was Wi-Fi, before there were cell phones. There were no cell phones in the world. And so we built our own. We took PCs and motorcycle batteries and ham radio and put them all together so we could simulate what cell phones, there weren't, we didn't know what you call cell phones, but they were, uh, would be like in the future. And, and we discovered lots of things. We did things that looked like Google Earth, but really local, things that looked like Snapchat, things that, I mean, all that stuff we did, like crappy academic versions of it. We never made any money. But, but this guy went on to lead uh, Google Glass, and that was a well-known fellow in Toronto, and so forth. So we actually had some things. One of the things I got was always, you know, that's all wonderful, but I'll never wear it, right? Because no rational person would wear stuff like that, right? So I started a collaboration with fashion schools around the world. And this is the first one that's in Paris. about. Here's the technology, fashion students. What will this look like? And this is the sort of stuff they designed. So they designed stuff that looks forever like the iPhone. You know, it's got fingerprint reader, flat screen display, batteries, radio. Uh, it controlled things like the, the head-mounted display um, that went on to become evolved into Google Glass. And, and you know, we saw this in like 1995. We should have invested in people at that point, but we didn't better. Um, the thing that surprised us, though, was the data. The thing that we had not anticipated in this is that the insights that come from having millisecond by millisecond data of the interactions, the locations, the interests of everybody. And we only had 20 people, but, but it was enough to see the sort of glimpse of the future, to be scared about it in some cases, but also to see that the stories about our psychology, the stories about sociology, the stories about politics were not correct in that they were not complete. Many things are true, but we don't know how to balance them. They were not a predictive theory. And we have the data now to finally do stuff. So the world today is full of data. So let me just give you a couple things to both motivate you and sort of tell you where we're going. So, you know, this is a spin-off company that I did a few years, about five years ago. It's now on Bloomberg. Um, it tracks the footfall of every store in America. It knows how many people go in and out the store. And it sells that data to Bloomberg and hedge funds. And, and incidentally, stores don't know how many people go in and out of their stores. It's all anonymous. It's compliant with GDPR. It actually doesn't use cell phones. It uses things like Wi-Fi and stuff like that. Um, but you can now track what's happening out there in a way 
that is completely unbelievable from even a couple years ago. Or this is another one. So this is a, a, a company that came from looking at patterns of interaction between people. And there's all this sort of theory about linguistics and social signaling and so forth. But we actually measured it. And we discovered that there are certain patterns that are correlated with empathy, correlated with calming people down. And we put this in call centers now. <coughs> and it wins awards all over because customers feel like they're being listened to. The employees love it because they're not being yelled at. And things just work a little bit better. So you didn't know about this stuff, right? It gives you, it should give you pause. It should give you pause because now you're seeing machines in intimate interactions. You're seeing them watching everything. What's going on? Well, let's think about that. So the biggest change is that this data allows us to do something that we've never able to do before, which is see the connections between people. Now we've, for years, we've had this thing, which was originally called social physics, which is statistics about individuals. And most of our systems are built on this. So, you know, you have grades, you have, you know, your credit rating. It's all about you. It's not about your social context. But if you look at what the great thinkers of the late 1700s and 1800s said, they didn't emphasize the individual. So Adam Smith talked about the invisible hand, right? The thing people took away was this rational individuals, but what he actually said was this. He said that it's human nature to exchange not only goods, but also ideas, and it's these exchanges, these peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, that create solutions for the, more, for the uh, good of the community. So that was in uh, Moral Sentiments. So what he's actually saying is, is that it's these individual interactions, the social network, the deals that we make with each other, which incidentally is why we care about privacy, because the deal I make with you may not be the deal I make with you. Privacy is required to make that happen. He's saying that these individual deals are the things that determine social norms, and that the social norms evolve to maximize these individual deals. That's almost exactly the opposite of a centralized clearing mechanism that we think of as markets. Or the democratic theory, which is, you know, everybody votes and you get the best government possible, right? <laughs> Maybe this stuff doesn't work quite as well as we thought. Maybe, actually, they had something to it back then. Um, <coughs> incidentally, it was not only Mar uh, uh, Adam Smith that said this, it was also Karl Marx. At the beginning, the Dutch Kapital, he says, society is the sum total of social relationships connecting its members. It's a theory about social networks, not a theory about individuals. And what I'm going to argue here is, is that both of these gentlemen had a good point. Not a complete point. We're still individuals. But it's a lot more important than we give credence to. So um, we started measuring this stuff. And particularly as cell phones and so forth became common, we were able to get large data sets, I'll show you some of these, uh, and be able to understand better about which of the classical theories are correct and in what circumstances. So we're not replacing sociology or psychology. We're making it more quantitative and more conditional on context. And, you know, there are papers in Nature talking about raising social science up to a new level. I wrote a paper uh, in 2010, David Mazar was the other conspirator here, uh, naming this computational social science. That's gotten, I think, 2,000 citations in the years since. It's also resulted in something like 400 academic units being set up around the world that cite this paper as one of their motivating elements. It has occurred to people that data can help us understand ourselves much better than we could when we were limited to Psych 101 surveys, which is where most of the things you know about yourself come from. Okay? So here's an example of things you don't probably know. I didn't know. So I talked to a telephone company and to 
doing surveys of 100,000 of its people, of its customers, to ask them age, income, gender, job type, income. And of course, as a telephone company, they know where people go because they see what cell towers you use. And they know who you call. Do you call people with the same job type as you or do you call more diverse set? It turns out that if you look at the diversity of their social network in terms of either where they go or in terms of the job types of the people that they talk to, you can predict their income pretty well. So zero. Even more interesting is you could stratify this sample into people with university degrees and above and people with sixth grade education or below, and they're not very different. Sorry. <laughs> Something's going on here. I like to think of what this is, is that if you have access to very diverse communities, you hear about more opportunities, you have the ability to assemble more capabilities, you have the ability to do things in a way that you wouldn't otherwise have. And this is complicated. We were talking about causal method, uh, uh, relationships earlier. This is clearly not one-way causality. It's both ways. It's complicated. But it is arguing that if you can increase people's access to opportunity, that they may do well, and that mechanisms that have to do with segregation, education, et cetera, are primarily acting through that mechanism. Right. So this is another example. This is a, a, one of my former students. Every dot here is a council in the UK. Councils are small neighborhoods with their own government. Um, along the bottom is connection diversity, which is the linear sum of amount of conversation within a neighborhood, a council, they're small neighborhoods, plus amount of conversation outside. So does this community talk to itself, and does it talk to the rest of society? The vertical axis is the sum of life expectancy, crime, GDP, and infant mortality, because those are very highly correlated with each other. So here's the, the thing to sort of think about. If you tell me how much your community talks to each other and how much you talk to the rest of society, I can tell you the likelihood of your baby dying. And this is an R squared of 0.85. This is like, there we are. Famous social scientist, nodding. <laughs> you don't get that in social science very often. This is a really strong relationship. Here's another sort of thing. So we looked at people moving around in San Francisco. Um, this is off our cell phone data. You can do it from transportation data or credit card data. What you find is, is that people don't walk around randomly. When you are out and about, you'll go to certain places that you find interesting. You're revealing your preferences. <coughs> Other people have similar preferences, and guess what? They'll go to the same places. So if I look at people that have good co-visits for certain places, I can predict which places you'll probably like. Okay? Oh, that's sort of cool. More interestingly is once I know your preferences for sort of when you're out and about, I know a lot about you because it's not just the things you reveal by where you go. It's what people learn from each other. So if the people in your crowd are all wearing a particular kind of new boot, you'll likely buy that boot. If they all are using some app, you're likely to use that app. You learn from each other. That doesn't mean you know them. You observe them. You may know some of them. It's a very tight social network. We looked at data um, from a uh, European city, a couple million people. And where we had demographic data, which included age, gender, income, voting record, uh, job type, stuff like that. And we asked, how well does all that demographic data predict buying behavior and health outcomes? Okay. Now, the thing that's interesting about that is that all of our systems, all of our commercial and government systems run on demographic data. When we compared it with this 
co-association thing that I just showed you, we could beat the demographic data in predicting people's behavior by 300%. That means basically, we've organized our society all wrong. <laughs> I mean, because you could do so much better. So for instance, if you wanted to screen for diabetes, <coughs> you have to know where the people with diabetes go. Now why do those people get diabetes? I don't really know, you know? But, but they do, good place to look for diabetes. You shouldn't be screening these guys here those guys, you should be screening for alcoholism. Okay. This is causal at some level, not uniquely causal. If you give coupons, give offers to people who talk to each other, that co-associate with each other, you get much bigger yields, much bigger uptakes than if you just distribute coupons everywhere. So this is a marketing thing, right? So like we worked with Telefonica, worked with uh, Telenor. We, over their screening bodies, convinced their marketing people to change the way they gave out offers to, to customers. They said, don't give it to random people based on demographics. Give it to groups of people that talk to each other and give it to everybody in the group. Well, you're wasting your money because, you know, no. Actually, five to 13 times better results. Now, caveat, this is from like 0.5% yield to 6.5%, right? So it's not like a huge thing, but that's a lot of money. And enough so that Telenor, for instance, uses this every country that it operate in. Here's another thing you might not know. So we gave out, um, uh, Cindy Litterman at, is at, in Denmark, gave out phones to everybody in the university. Uh, they all knew they were being bugged. Uh, and, and we asked, well, what things predict grades in a university? And the answer is the best thing is, uh, best prediction is if you communicate with uh, peers that aren't doing very well, that will predict your failure. The green things are social things, which you don't measure here. Just to be clear, right? Nobody measures this. So these are all social things. Communicating with high performing peers, low performing mean, right? Okay, oh, class attendance. So that's something you do measure, <laughs> right? And then, uh, oh, here, conscientiousness. There's a personality one, self-esteem, endowment. Look at those other ones up there. Social concept matters. Now this is not simple causality. It's not like I know somebody who's not doing well, therefore I'm going to fail. It is people with certain attitudes learn from each other, they hang together, they reinforce their attitudes, and you get these little micro islands of failing or winning context, okay? So um, you can combine these though, these networks are better than individual things, better than Personality. We've done things where we've looked at specific classes and asked a whole range of things, like how well can the professors predict how well people do, how well can uh, the people predict how well they're going to do, and in every case it's the social things that outperform. Oh, and then here's another thing. So, you know how the AIs are going to take your jobs? You remember that, right? So what happens when the AIs take your jobs? What's the best skills to have? Well, the worst skills to have <laughs> are technical skills. Because <laughs> obviously if they took your job, they've automated your technical skill, right? The best, so this is from data that is a, a national survey by the government of a sampling of every sort of job in every sort of city in the United States. Very big survey. Uh, and they asked everybody what skills are in your job. And then they looked at who was able to be reemployed most easily uh, after having gotten uh, made redundant, as they say, right? And the people who have social skills, which is basically an ability to work with other people, were the most employable. The people who had the worst one are their knowledge. <laughs> uh, okay. 
That's why we make social skills and the ability to work with other people such a core of our educational curriculum, right? Maybe you ought to think about this. I have a friend, he runs a university in Singapore. He brings in fresh people, so in our neighbors, we have a no problem to some of this, okay? And he runs a course that he calls Hearts and Wings. And he teaches people to believe in themselves and <coughs> network with other people and find people to help them. That's the course. And that's a mandatory course for everybody who comes in to address these sorts of things. And then they keep that up the whole time. It's pretty interesting. Maybe we ought to do that. So anyway, the whole point of this was to convince you that you don't know everything about people, even though we all act like we do know that every day. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Um, uh, and I hope you don't mind that I'm having fun at this. <laughs> I just enjoy throwing grenades into things. Um, so the point is, is, is that we defaultly think about this rational individual model all the time. If you listen to human language, listen to people talk about it, we talk about it as if this is the way we are constantly. We set up incentives, we set up structures, we set up governance, we evaluate things based on that model which is drawn from the late 1700s. What I've been trying to argue is that, in fact, human behavior and human competence is at least 50% social. That means you have to pay attention to what people are, what students are learning from each other. You have to learn, pay attention to the fact that the big decisions you make depend on the decisions you see others like you making. Is that determines all sorts of things. And there's just a ton of evidence about this. It means different social structures. It means we have to do things differently. So I talked about the demographics, how uh, that's sort of a lame way to describe uh, uh, the preferences and outcomes in cities. What are we going to do? And the context of all of this at the beginning was, you know, folks, we're losing the race. We have all these new technologies, we can't keep up with it, there's stress, our robot overlords are coming, whatever. You know, we have to somehow become better at adapting our organizations to be more fluid, and we have to make smarter decisions if we're going to keep up with all these challenges. Right? So to, to cause people little bits of shock, uh, I often say, um, you know, Actually, global warming is a pretty easy problem. We all have to just sort of talk about it, decide what to do, and then do it, right? <laughs> and, and you laugh, you should laugh, because us talking about what to do and then doing it is just inconceivable. So the problem is not global warming, the problem is us and our inability to organize and make decisions and then execute on them. Okay, well maybe the reason we can't make decisions and execute on them is that we don't understand who we are and how we make decisions. And I've tried to sort of argue that in fact we don't understand that. What can we do? Well, I don't have the answer, but I have a suggestion. Okay? Um, so, and the suggestion is coming from all the deep learning that's going to take over our jobs. Um, the key with deep learning as with all these sort of AI techniques, is a very simple thing called a credit assignment function. So you have this like, this sort of generic thing. You have this like really complicated network full of dumb neurons, right? Dumb neurons are just like little, typically linear decision mechanisms. And what you do is you run millions of examples of kitties, and when it says, yes, that's a kitty, you reinforce the connections that got it right. And when it gets it wrong, you say, okay, now I'm going to penalize the connections that got it wrong. Okay? In a nutshell, that's it. If you know something about this, you probably do too. I know this isn't everything. But that's basically it. And so it's this feedback from positives and negatives. Notice that you do not change the nodes, you change the connections things feed forward. 
And notice that it's lots and lots of, 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 of examples to do that. And that's it. That's it. And all the other stuff is, you know, detail. Okay, well, let's look at what happens in humans. So this is a human organization, social network. You know, so the typical organization, we've got problems, people talk to each other, they come up with some solutions, right? But in human organizations, so, so the, the, the nodes here are probably smarter than in deep learning. Trust me, even, even if you don't think very much about people, the nodes are smarter than <laughs> And we have these connections. Uh, but what we typically don't do is a good job of feedback. Sometimes we'll penalize these guys if they get it wrong. But actually, they got fed by all these guys, right? Or maybe we'll penalize the boss up here or something. But you know, we don't keep track of how well of our organizations work. There's not enough data. Don't be scared of data. We want to have more data, but we want to know what sort of data, and we want the data to be correct, trustworthy. So the key to getting out of a lot of this is to have Lots and lots and lots of examples that you can trust. You know their ontology, you know their semantics, and you can feed them back to redesign our organizations. And an interesting observation is that every organization in the world has a thing called an org chart, organization chart, right? So in the sort of AI deep learning terms, that means that every organization in the world has decided to be stupid. They, no, sorry, they decided we are not going to learn. What we are going to do is keep these organizations, these connections that aren't working. And you know, it's like, yeah, okay. No wonder things don't work so well. Sometimes they, they you know, sort of de facto change the connections, and that results in silos in organizations, segregation, different opinions about things, lack of coordination. That's not so good either. So what I'm arguing here is that we need to begin to give feedback to people much more than we do currently. And I'll show you a couple of examples in it. So this is an example um, that some people here have seen. So we built these, those, you know those horrible wearable computers that I showed you at the beginning that were so funny? So they got turned into little boxes which these guys are wearing, and now actually they're little tiny things that you stick behind your name badge. So if you wear a name badge, you can wear a wearable computer. And what it keeps track of is it keeps track of who talks to who. It doesn't listen to the words, because it's not that smart, and people don't like that. And um, what we can do then is make a uh, graph of which departments talk to what other departments. So for instance, we did this in Germany in a bank. This is all the email, that's all the conversations face to face. Nobody ever talks to customer service. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Problems because of that. And when we showed them the graph, they fixed it. Right? They moved customer service in with everybody else. So there's many things you can learn if you actually measure what happens. But almost no corporation in the world does this. Part of it is that there's privacy concerns. Partly is that people just don't know how to do this credit assignment problem. But there are examples. How many of you have heard of Moneyball? Lots of people. So Moneyball was, um, I'm going to get the names right, but it's a, a sports team, uh, not north of here. It had no money. Oakland. Uh, huh? Oakland A's. The Oakland A's. OK, there we are. Everybody know the Oakland A's? OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Had no money. But what they could do is they could collect statistics about players rather than go with the high-priced uh, recruiters and bid with everybody else. So they got a bunch of cheap players, but those cheap players had the property that every time they were on the field with their current you know, college or, or high school even thing, people started scoring. So something that they were doing was good. In other words, what they were doing is picking people who, were, who had good connections and hoping that if they brought them to their team, that the connections would continue to be good. Right? And they kept that up. And you know, very quickly, they won the pennant and you know, the, the world championship. And the world was, was happy. And then other people caught on. 
And today in sports teams, they use these sorts of credit assignment functions together with some human judgment on top of it. And that's standard practice across sports teams. So we do have examples. Another example is um, Toyota uh, in the 70s, 80s, uh, zoomed up the charts to take world dominance as sort of the largest manufactured autos because they had something called Kaizen, which is often called continuous improvement here in this country. Basically, they looked at how the cars they were manufacturing worked. Every week they got together and they brainstormed about how they could change the connections to do it better. So they didn't actually change the designs or the people. It's not like they fired people or things like that. They did things in different order. They sometimes modified you know, how things fit together things like that, to make it work better and better. So lots of data for feedback. Um, in these sorts of situations, where I said we have this, this spin-off called Humanize that does this for large corporations, the examples where showing people the feedback, right, about what connections there are, and asking them what they would like to see, dramatically improves cooperation and information sharing and interestingly, makes co-located teams very statistically similar to face-to-face -face teams. So it seems that a lot of the problem with distance teams is they just forget to talk to other people, and if you show them what they're actually doing, they're sort of good-hearted and they're not trying to do better. Um, this is a more recent thing. We put this in video conferencing. So we have people uh, in education, online education, break them into small groups, they get to talk. There's a little display that we did with Ken and Kim many years ago, did something like this earlier today. Um, and uh, what we're able to do is promote more even inter interactions. We've discovered that men and women have a different pattern of interruption. We're trying to uh, fix that. Um, and what we've been able to do is pretty dramatically uh, improve the user experience in these distance courses, and um, also the course completion rate. And recently, the government of Canada just signed up to have us help them uh, convince uh, all the small businesses in Canada to use AI. So we're going to be teaching about AI to small businesses using this platform to help them form better teams and connections and learn from each other. This is one, one of my students is Chinese. Um, I have an institute in China uh, that's funded by the government to sort of look at connections and innovation. Um, and this is a survey of, there's a bigger one now, but, but at one time it was all of the startups in China. Wow, really? So one out of all the governments in all the different parts of China, and they found 3,255 uh, startups that were um, far enough long that they could be quantified. And they asked what factors were important in this startup being successful, and correlated with the, uh, uh, the success of the startup. And the most important factor was cultural diversity. People talking to each other with different backgrounds. So what they mean by cultural diversity is people who had had experience in different countries outside of China. So diversity in your experience outside of China was the single biggest factor in, in creating uh, successful startups. Industrial diversity means that they had different training. You know, they were finance guys or engineers or whatever. They weren't all from the same sort of background. So you wouldn't expect that, because you would expect educational attainment, funding maybe, uh, other sort of contextual variables. But no, it was this sort of diversity. That goes back to the things I was talking about earlier, where income is related to the diversity of connections that you have, where health outcomes, social health outcomes, are related to whether your um, community is integrated with the rest of the society. And here we're seeing innovation depending on diversity of backgrounds. There's something going on here that's not in your typical story. 
We have uh, mobility data it's from cell phones for is about 10% of all the humans in Beijing. Um, um, and what we did is we looked at the sort of diversity in a couple ways. One diversity is that if you're looking at a particular district, and these are, you know, small districts. They're like zip codes or zip plus four codes, actually, probably more likely. Uh, you ask, how many different areas do the workers come from? Are they all workers of one sort of socioeconomic class, or are they workers from many socioeconomic classes? And you can make a, uh, a major... Uh, diversity in the connections, and it turns out this predicts uh, capital growth indices pretty well. Same thing works in Europe, same thing works in the United States. Uh, this is an example in Beijing where we could predict uh, GDP growth year on year, account for about half of the variance, a little less than half of the variance that's similar to the US or similar to Europe. They don't teach you this. Right? You're like, what's this got to do with anything? It's just like that graph with income and diversity. Um, it's like, that's not standard economics, boys and girls. Right? So it's, the difference is instead of looking at um, individuals, we're looking at social fabric. We're looking at the contextual variables as well as the individual variables. And, and, and I think it has more to do with the ideas and access to opportunities than it has to do with other things that you might imagine. Right? We don't know completely. It's not like this is a solved problem. Um, here's one. Um, uh, so we have scary data uh, from the US. Um, so this is data that is aggregated to a zip plus four, sort of very small things. Okay, uh, It's mobile phone data. Um, we don't actually have this data, but we have access to this data. In many cases, we don't hold this data because that could be stupid and dangerous. We simply have to do the <coughs> analytics on other people's data. Okay? So this is um, Boston, uh, the MIT, and then around there. The color here has to do with how segregated uh, that little area of town is. So um, things that are blue are good in the sense that you have both rich people and poor people there. Things that are red are bad. Um, what's interesting is, is you can ask, how much does the inequality of experience depend on zoning and structures like neighborhoods? And the answer is it's only about half due to that zoning stuff. The rest of it is due to you guys. If you are in a particular street, you might have a Dunkin' Donuts, or you might have a Starbucks. If you're a wealthier person, and it's a slightly, maybe I shouldn't pick these two, but, but um, let me pick something different. Okay, yeah, so you have a, um, a Japanese restaurant and a Korean restaurant. Um, which one do you go into? How many people go into the Japanese restaurant as opposed to the Korean? Raise your hand. How many go into the Korean restaurant? Oh, boy, this isn't working at all. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out, Japanese restaurants um, are, are very well mixed. Their income classes of all sorts go there. Korean restaurants are not. Rich people don't go to Korea. Same thing with, with Dunkin' Donuts. People don't go, rich people don't go to Dunkin' Donuts, even though it's cheaper. Because that's where all the bubble tea is or something. I don't know what it is. Rich people go to Starbucks. Right? And even if you find pairs that are exactly the same price, what happens is the choices you make in the moment are about half of segregation in this country. <coughs> and this is across all the major metropolitan. So you want to ask why you know the red states and the blue states, you know, have this sort of big battle and people don't talk to each other? It's because they don't talk to each other, and about half of that is not just geography; it's choices for self-segregation. Want to think about that? Okay. Um, 
you can do stuff with this. So this is uh, an experiment I did on 130 people with living quarters, married couples, small kids, 18 months, plug their phones, they knew it, IRB, all that good stuff. Um, and what we found was you could calculate something that I'll call here a social capital. You'll notice this in quotes. Don't let me yell at me for misusing the word. Um, but that is the amount of reciprocal interactions people have. So I talk to you, you call back, or I see you physically, you come over and visit me, text, same thing. Best in this data was call, but just a little better than physical. If I know your social capital with somebody, I can predict whether you will loan them money, loan them your car, or let them watch your baby with about 94% accuracy. So that's trust behaviors. I can predict trust behaviors from your interaction behaviors. Moreover, we did an experiment where we got people to behave more healthily, get more active, okay? And it turns out you can predict how effective, so there's a social thing where we would give, uh, you know, if I wanted to make you more active, I would give some of your friends an incentive, a monetary incentive. I could predict how effective they would be at changing your behavior by the same data. What's really interesting is, is that our sense of being embedded with other people actually has these very rough and ready behavioral characteristics. And you can begin thinking about changing behavior actually without violating privacy because you just need to have a sense of your own interaction pattern <coughs> to be able to do certain things with this. You can imagine doing this within a corporation. How much do you interact very diversely? How much do you interact just with the same people? Wouldn't it be interesting to feed that back to people? Anyway, um, so bottom line there, human connections are the main driver of innovation is a good claim. Um, and this business of having feedback is a thing I'm calling human AI. Um, and that can help improve our social structures continuously. That's the claim, okay? However, you need detailed high frequency data about performance, like that segregation stuff I showed you. Uh, and you need to commit to constantly changing your org chain if you're gonna do this path of development. Okay, <coughs> so I have 10 minutes left, and I'm gonna take them, okay? You, this is your chance to object. Okay, so um, one, of the, one of the, he gets to object, this is me, right? <laughs> So, so, so I've showed you this stuff, and, and I hope that you're interested, that maybe you think, gosh, that could be really interesting, and you should be creeped out, because the level of data that's available should be surprising to you, okay? How do you handle data correctly? So I run a group at MIT called the Trust Data Alliance, which is funded by these people, as well as the governments of France, Colombia, Israel, China, uh, uh, the World Bank, and people like that. And what it's doing is it's trying to figure out how to handle data so that you can get the good parts of this, which are the insights, without violating privacy, without spreading data around, without cybersecurity risk. I mentioned already that I was involved in the discussions that eventually led to Europe's privacy regulation. So last year, the president of the EU invited me to come <coughs> lecture all the ministers of the EU uh, on how to handle data correctly. So I said, so, sorry, I need more time. It's amazing, <laughs> right, you know. Um, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, Eurostat, which is the official data thing, uh, decided to buy into what we were selling. So that's good, right? What were we selling? Uh, well, Share data to answer my data. What everybody does is they take all of it, wow, get all the data and put it in one place and they'll analyze it, right? And of course, that's a horrendous mistake. First of all, you can't really control what people are doing with that data, but second of all, you made a honeypot. <coughs> you know? 
Military guys figured out in about 1400 that this was a mistake. If you stick all your troops in one thing and put a wall around them, somebody always leaves the door open, and then you lose everything. 70% of data breaches happen through human error or malevolence. You want to have defense in depth. Spread your resources around. Don't make copies of data unless you absolutely have to. What that means is you have a federated data system where you have to ask questions of things rather than putting the data in one spot. Okay? It turns out that from a legal point of view, not only is that safer, but it's something that the lawyers will agree to better. So if I can record on an immutable ledger, and we like to use the word blockchain because everybody is excited about blockchains, <coughs> um, it's just a ledger that has multiple computers verifying that blockchains themselves are very old. Centuries ago. Um, if you log all the questions that are asked of a, a database and you log what the questions are and what the answers are, then you can have continuous audit of your data systems. <coughs> all got that? If you stick it in one spot, you're going to get somebody doing stuff you can't control and maybe you'll lose it all. If you keep it spread and you log all the questions, all the answers, or all the algorithms that are used, and that's why we call this open algorithms, then you can know what was asked, you can see if it's fair, you can see if it's biased, you can see if people are abusing the data, and you can do that continuously, which means you can find things quickly and not 10 years later. Okay? So that's what Eurostat brought in. Um, so let me give you an example. So what you do is you present your credential along with a request to do an algorithm that's pre-agreed and stored on the ledger. So literally you Python code, right? If your ledger, if your credentials are good, so you're allowed to do this, that server, like the, the telephone company, will take the algorithm and run it on their database behind their firewall, no moving or copying data, and then post the answer on this ledger, which is available and perhaps receive payment. Okay? And this can all be encrypted so that nobody but the people with the correct permissions can see it, but you can audit it. You can ask, are they giving the correct answers? Are they giving biased answers? You know what the algorithms are because they're the things that were actually stored on the blockchain. Very different way of doing things, but almost everything fits into this situation. Initial research and development is not very good in this format, but that can be a way to test data. I chair AT&T's big data board. AT&T does this for every telephone call. It's not crazy. Estonia has been doing this for 20 years. Estonia had a full-on attack by Russia, wiped out everything in the country, cyber attack. Right? They were able to completely reconstruct their state using this type of technique. Pretty amazing. That's the only survival from a full-on cyber attack that we've had so far. Okay. Um, we are building national systems for Colombia and Senegal, uh, ironically paid for by the government of France, um, and Colombia, some. Um, but what it does is it combines telco data, bank data, government data, transportation data, to produce an open database that's like a census data, so it's that sort of aggregation, uh, but much richer than census data, and potentially done weekly for about no money. Well, on big scales, it's about no money. Okay. And we have continuous oversight for all the things we care about. So for instance, we're working with the American Adel Development Bank to have fairness monitoring be part of the system. So these two, here's another one. So if you read the Snowden papers, you might have noticed that the moment you decrypt data ever, somebody steals it. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, that means you have to do all that AI stuff on encrypted data. Isn't that a contradiction in terms? The answer is no. Actually, you can run 
AI techniques on Encrypt Your Data. I'll show you a little bit about how that works. Uh, I had the head of the US's intelligence services IT in my office. It took me two hours to convince him this was real. Um, he then briefed the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Turns out not everybody knows this. Maybe you don't either. Um, if you do that, turns out you don't need firewalls anymore because it's all encrypted. And people think this is really interesting. This is by Larry Lessig, famous public law uh, professor. What he's saying is, is that if I compute insights across data that's encrypted without decrypting it, it does not legally count as sharing the data. Because I'm not asking about the individual thing. So it does not endanger your personal data or your company's data, nor does it count as moving data out of the jurisdiction or country. So for instance, you could ask of all the hospitals whether some drug worked without endangering either the patients or the reputation of the hospital. Wouldn't it be nice to know how well some of these medicines work? Turns out we don't know, <laughs> okay? I'd like to know. Or uh, you could ask banks who run these dark trading pools. You know, are you guys all invested in the same derivatives? If they are, like they were in 2007, <laughs> it's a problem, okay? But they can't share data, so they didn't know. So only post hoc data can see that. But using this sort of technique, you can do that. <coughs> That's why I changed that. Let me show you an example. So um, this is the type of modeling we do with humans. So people who interact influence each other, right? That's pretty uncontroversial. That looks a little like a physics model, but it's an inhomogeneous uh, uh, isinglass or whatever, spin glass sort of thing. But it's inhomogeneous, <coughs> the usual. Turns out you can solve for all the things. So this is an example of an earth early thing where we took Bluetooth pings from all the people in uh, uh, good fraction of people in my lab and in the Sloan School. And we asked, what about the social structure? So if people have a social relationship, you see that in the patterns of interactions. And it turns out we could do a really good job at figuring out who were friends, who would be appropriate, who would be bought. More interesting, we could figure out who would likely be friends in six months in the future, <laughs> because they would have a friendship pattern that wasn't fully developed. Okay? The most interesting thing is we did all this, and it was really cool, and then realized we didn't actually need the data to do that. We just had like these ping symbols, right? We could encrypt the data and get equal performance. As long as the symbol here predicts the symbol there, we're good, right? You don't need to know what the symbol represents. It can be a hash. Think about that. So this is an example. So this is the Bitcoin uh, uh, blockchain, you can ask the question, well, every time he does a transaction, does he do a transaction? Or they just have to be with each other. And just, his stuff seems to predict your stuff. Well, I don't know what the causal structure there is, but I do know that there is one, because that doesn't happen by chance. And it turns out we could recreate a lot of the, the very expensive, time-consuming detective work to rediscover frauds, who's involved in fraud using this sort of method. And it turns out this is not expensive to do this sort of thing. If you do it right, you know, do it on a laptop, it's not a big Hadoop call, this sort of thing. And we formed a, a, a spin-off called Endor, you can look at it. Uh, the guys that did it were members of the uh, Israeli intelligence services, you can let your imagination wander. Um, but it also serves uh, MasterCard and Coke and Walmart and people like that. And they're about to make it something that's a web service. So you too can do this on your encrypted data for not too much money. So um, anyway, that's it. Um, I'm only four minutes over. Um, we have a couple books that you can get at. They're on Amazon. One is the Trust Data, which talks about the sort of philosophy here. Uh, it's got the papers that I wrote for the Obama White House on this, uh, about security, the papers I wrote for the World Economic Forum, which started the 
Glad to see discussion in the papers for the Secretary General of the UN that helped get um, data goals incorporated into the Sustainable Development Goals. And then 12 bucks will flow it off of it. Okay. And then there's one about financial technology if you're interested in that. So thank you. So what, what actually happens is you present encrypted data columns, okay? And they can't be encrypted with rolling encrypting. You don't have a fixed speed. Um, so that the symbol corresponds to the same bucket, okay? And you can discover these social relationships in this. So you get a structure, which is essentially a social graph out of that. Uh, if you then give me a couple of examples, I can find you other ones that have a relationship to the examples you have. So for instance, if you give me people who are having financial trouble, I, it turns out I can identify other people who are likely to have, but I don't know that it's financial trouble. I just said, well, you gave me these examples, and according to my social graph, these are other examples that ought to be the same. I don't know the semantics. Only you know the semantics. Because it's your encrypted data, and you gave me some examples. Okay, that's actually sort of cool because what that means is I can take another piece of encrypted data, put it up there, and you can say, well, does this help me predict my problem? So you run this thing on it and give it a couple examples. Well, gosh, that's much better. This new data is valuable, but you haven't revealed what you're interested in, and I haven't revealed what this new data is. But now we can say, well, you know, how much is it worth to you? Right? <laughs> that sort of thing. But we haven't revealed anything. And that's why it really makes a big difference, is because you don't have to share the semantics of what you're doing. Right? And, in, in, and it's not magic. What, the, what we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Is that, you know, if you had a physics example, like a mechanical thing, and I said, well, what we're going to do is use Gibbs sampling to fit polynomials, exponentials, and uh, uh, sinusoids to it, right? You say, yeah, sure, that should give me some sort of practical model for predicting what the thing does. Well, so we have these sort of models for how people interact built into it, and we look for patterns that are typical of people interacting, which means it won't work for jet engines, it won't work for physical examples, but maybe by accident or something, <laughs> I don't think so. But it will work for things that are crowd behavior. Okay? So there's many things that are crowd behavior. And so I think that's an example of what the sort of new generation of AI will do. It'll have a knowledge about the domain built in. And suddenly you can work with much more noisy data, much less data, potentially even encrypted data, and it changes things. There are other methods of doing this, like secure multi-party computation is an example that we, we use. But that requires, typically requires specific encryption methods uh, be applied so that you can do the bit twiddling. So this is a little more general. It's a more general in one sense, less general in other senses. Um, so this question is for Stephen as well. Sure. Um, this question has to do with, um, you said the connections have greater causality and predictive and prediction than demographics or utilize, you know, returning insights than demographics. Has the study ever been compared uh, disaggregating the nature of connections, like what type of area of active inquiry, which I think is a great thing to say. So no, we don't really have a good answer. However, um, I'm a bit of a zealot about physical interactions versus online interactions. Because what I see is that the online <coughs> usually doesn't have anything like the predictive power of physical interactions. Now, it's also clear that there's gray areas, like what about telephone? Well, telephone is actually pretty good, 
But it turns out telephone connections predict physical interactions with great reliability. Call somebody, you're likely to see them sometime, and vice versa. So, so they're connected in, 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 a, in that way. Um, but I'm not a big believer in online. On the other hand, if you look at the startups, okay, so, so that was physical connection, but it was diversity in the past. So somebody had this history, and this person had a different history, and then you brought them together, and they were better able to do things. Um, uh, that's a, I mean, that's a different type of thing. You say, well, what sort of diversity are we looking at? Well, I don't really know. I know um, just the examples that I have, which tend to be higher diversity in these cases is generally correlated with socioeconomic level in the data that I have, right? So it doesn't mean that that's the truth or anything, but that seems to work for a lot of things. Um, Obviously, you know, in startups, that was not socioeconomic, you know, pretty, you know, high-end people, um, but it was diversity in the past. So now we're saying, again, you know, area of extra study, <laughs> I guess is the right thing to say. Well, let's thank our speaker once again. Please join us.